All right. Um, I will call the Senate Judiciary Committee to order. Will the secretary please take the roll? Senator Harris. Here. Senator Orenshaw. Senator Don Darrell Lou. Senator Wynn. Here. Senator Hansen. Senator Krasner. Here. Senator Stone. Here. Chair Scheibel. Here, thank you so much. Please mark Senator Orenshaw excused and please mark Senator Hansen present when he arrives. All right, welcome everybody to uh, Friday Judiciary Committee. We do have five bills on our schedule for today, and my plan is to take them in order, um, uh, starting with SB 321. And I'll go ahead and invite um, our colleague, Senator Krasner, down to the table and uh, open up the hearing. You may begin when you're ready. Thank you, Chair Scheibel and members of the Senate Judiciary Committee. <laughs> For the record, I am Senator Lisa Krasner, proudly representing Nevada State Senate District 16. I appreciate the opportunity to come before you today to present Senate Bill 321, which expands protections for survivors of sexual assault in relation to DNA evidence that is gathered from a victim's rape kit or part of an investigation or a sexual assault. Sadly, many rapes and other forms of sexual assault go unreported. It is estimated that only one-third of all rapes in the United States are reported. There are various reasons for this, including fear of reprisal from the offender, fear of not being believed, fear of being blamed or victim-shamed, fear of having to relive the trauma of a rape in court, and the list goes on. Another reason that a victim may not come forward to report a sexual assault is fear of what their personal DNA from their sexual assault or rape kit will be used for without their knowledge or consent. The fear of having one's personal DNA information shared by law enforcement with another agency or another entity once it is stored in a laboratory or database as part of a rape kit that is created when a victim reports a sexual assault. According to the Federal Bureau of Investigation, in 2019, Nevada ranked fifth in the nation in reported rapes per capita. Since 2019, we have seen a small but steady decline in reported rapes in our state. For example, according to Nevada crime statistics, in 2021, there were 1,884 rapes reported to law enforcement. Over the past five years, Nevada has seen a decrease in reported rapes, but we have to wonder if that just means that victim survivors are choosing not to come forward and report the rape to law enforcement. I want to mention one other statistic that is especially troubling. In 2022, the clearance rate for reported rapes in Nevada was just under 20%. That means only one in five rapes reported in Nevada resulted in an arrest. We have to do better and collecting and properly processing rape kits is vital to that effort. We must do everything we can to help victims feel safe in coming forward and reporting rape. I believe the way to move us in that direction is to guarantee rape victims that their DNA will not be used for any other purpose except to solve the crime or apprehend the perpetrator, and that their DNA will be safely stored and not shared unless that sharing assists in arresting the perpetrator of their assault. Now I would like to walk the committee through the sections of the bill. Section three provides that unless it is required by state or federal law, no law enforcement agency or forensic laboratory will store a survivor's DNA profile in any database that allows for the storage or exchange of such records. This includes, but is not limited to, the state DNA database, the combined DNA index system, or CODIS, and any other similar database. Nor may law enforcement agencies share or disclose to any other agency or entity a survivor's DNA profile or other forensic evidence identifying the survivor except pursuant to a court order or if sharing this information is necessary to identify or prosecute the perpetrator of the survivor's sexual assault. 
Section 6 expands the rights of a survivor by prohibiting a law enforcement agency from using the DNA forensic evidence taken from the survivor of sexual assault and their rape kit to prosecute the survivor for any crime, to search for evidence of any other crime of the survivor or the survivor may have committed, or for any other purpose not directly related to the sexual assault of the survivor unless doing so is required by state or federal law. Finally, Section 7 of the bill provides that to the extent money is available, the Central Repository for Nevada Records of Criminal History, the State DNA Database, and each forensic laboratory will conduct an audit of the DNA information they store or maintain to analyze their compliance with state law on preservation of such evidence and identify the number of DNA profiles that should have been collected in the year 2021 but were not. The results of these audits are to be submitted to the Joint Interim Standing Committee on Judiciary by January 1, 2024. This concludes my discussion of SB 321. Chair Scheibel and members of the committee, thank you for your time and your attention. I would like to also thank Washoe County Sheriff's Office, Las Vegas Metro Police Department, the Nevada District Attorneys Association, the Washoe and Clark County Public Defender's Office, the Nevada Coalition to End Sexual and Domestic Violence, and the ACLU, as well as all of the other people who helped with this bill and who will testify in support today. We have a solemn responsibility to do everything we can to protect victims and ensure that sexual assault victims feel safe coming forward to report sexual assault. A sexual assault victim's DNA from their rape kit should only be used for two purposes, one, to solve the crime, and two, to apprehend the perpetrator. I hope you will join me in supporting SB 321. Thank you. Uh, my name is Steven Johnson, um, the director of the Forensic Science Division at the Washington County Sheriff's Office, for the record. Um, and we are in support of this, uh, this bill. This bill will help expand the protections from victims um, to any database that could be created uh, for DNA storage of DNA evidence. Good afternoon, Chair, members of the committee. For the record, my name is Serena Evans, and I'm the Policy Director for the Nevada Coalition to End Domestic and Sexual Violence. NCE DSV represents 13 direct service providers statewide, all of which are in favor of this legislation and the impact it will have on victim survivors. We want to thank Senator Krasner for bringing this legislation forward. I think many of us saw the case um, in the news articles of what happened in San Francisco, and that case was horrendous, and we fear that that story, making national headlines, will have a chilling effect on victim survivors coming forward and seeking justice in the future. Enduring a sexual assault is extremely painful, and we need a process that does not further traumatize or alienate victim survivors. When victim survivors consent to receiving a sexual assault forensic exam, commonly referred to as a SANE exam, they do so under the trust and belief that their DNA will be used to seek justice in their case in other sexual assault crimes. Any other use of evidence collected from a survivor's body goes against the spirit and intent of the Sexual Assault Survivors Bill of Rights. We know that sexual assault is one of the most underreported crimes, and if victim survivors are fearful that their DNA will be used for other purposes, they may be dissuaded from reporting or receiving the SANE exam at all. This piece of legislation is important not only for ensuring that victim survivors feel safe to come forward and report, but that they feel safe to receive a SANE exam. A SANE exam offers so much more than just evidence collection. It allows the victim survivor to receive prophylactic medications, emergency contraceptions, STI testing, and connections to critical resources and follow-up care. Fear of their DNA being used elsewhere or the lack of privacy may leave victim survivors without the necessary care that they need. All victim survivors of sexual assault should feel safe in pursuing justice and that their privacy and autonomy are protected and respected. Healing is about restoring power and agency after it's been taken during a sexual assault, and that bill will do just that. Thank you. This bill. We're, we're here to stand for any questions anyone may have. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Are there any questions from members of the committee? 
I don't see any questions. <laughs> All right then. We will move to testimony and support. Uh, as a reminder, you will have two minutes to, um, each person will have two minutes to speak. If somebody else has already said what you plan to say, it is more than okay just to say ditto or I agree. Um, we we take that very seriously as, as if you gave your own testimony. So we'll start down here in uh, Carson City. Uh, go ahead whenever you're ready. My name is Barry Cole, B-A-R-R-Y, C-O-L-E. I'm a psychiatrist here in northern Nevada. And I would say that it is very common in the psychiatric community for our patients to have been assaulted in the past. Uh, you've heard the number 30% of sexual assaults are reported. That may be an optimistic number. I've seen statistics as low as 10% with a background rate of one in five women, one in 70 men. But I would, I would want to champion for the women and men that I have treated that have been sexually assaulted that being able to prosecute the perpetrator is something that often comes up in their therapy and it was 70 years ago that DNA's structure was found in 1953. So it's kind of auspicious that on the 70th anniversary maybe we can use this evidence in a constructive way and not intimidate someone that if they report this that it will be used against them at a later date. Thank you. Good morning, Chair and members of the committee. My name is Maria Teresa Lieberman Barraga, M A R I A hyphen T E R E S A L I E B E R M A N N hyphen P A R R A G A. I'm the Deputy Director of Battleborn Progress, and we strongly support this bill. And we really thank um, Senator Krasner for bringing this forward. It's extremely important. And ditto to what the presenters and everyone said, but an added factoid that uh, sexual assault is one of the least reported crimes times and this part of this fear of what could happen to um, your information and what is being uh, collected is can play into that fear and so anything that we can do to make sure that folks aren't having that intimidation and that fear um, is extremely important so please support this bill thank you Good afternoon, Chair, members of the committee, Erica Roth, E-R-I-C-A-R-O-T-H, on behalf of the Washoe County Public Defender's Office, testifying in support this afternoon. I first want to thank uh, the Senator for working with stakeholders on this bill and having us all come together. Um, I think it's very important, and this bill sends the correct message to ensure um, protections from government overreach and keeping law enforcement accountable. Um, and so I appreciate the work that's been done, and. Uh, urge your, your support. Thank you. Lilith Barron, L-I-L-I-T-H-B-A-R-A-N with the ACLU of Nevada. I'd like to echo the sentiments of those before me and congratulate the Senator on this smart piece of legislation and thank her for bringing all of us together. Thank you. Good afternoon, Chair and Committee members. My name is Drew Franklin, D-R-E-W-F-R-A-N-K-L-I-N with R&R &R Partners, here representing the Nevada Sheriffs and Chiefs Association. We are in support of SB 321 and would like to thank Senator Krasner and all the bill sponsors for bringing this bill forward. We appreciate the amazing work and constant improvements that continue to come from the forensic science labs in Washoe and Clark counties. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. John Pure from the Clark County Public Defender's Office. <laughs> we support this bill with the amendment by the Washoe County Sheriff's Office that went into it. Uh, we thank Senator Krasner for bringing everybody in a room, working on this together. DNA evidence is both important to exonerate the innocents and catch the actual perpetrators of a crime. We think that this bill strikes the right balance uh, with the amendment and would go a long way towards protecting victims. Chair Scheibel, members of the committee, for the record, Carlos Hernandez, representing the Nevada State AFL-CIO. Uh, on behalf of over 150,000 members and more than 120 unions, the Nevada State AFL-CIO proudly supports Senate Bill 321. We'd like to thank Senator Lisa Krasner for her years of, of advocacy and dedication on this issue and urge the committee to support the bill. Thank you. 
Good afternoon, Chair Scheibel, Vice Chair Harris, and the Senate Committee on Judiciary. My name is Chris Reese, it's R-I-E-S, and I represent the Las Vegas Metropolitan Police Department. I want to thank Senator Krasner for working with us on this legislation, and we are in support of uh, SB 321 as amended. To be clear, LVMPD does not put DNA samples of known victims into CODIS. Um, with that said, we appreciate codifying this into the statute, and uh, thanks, Senator Krasner, Krasner, for her work. We are in support. Thank you. Good afternoon, Chair Scheibel, members of the committee, Jason Walker, Wash County Sheriff's Office, supporting Senate Bill 321 as amended. Happy to have been in the working group meetings to assess with the amendment. Thank you to Senator Krasner for bringing this forward. Thank you to Wash County uh, Crime Lab Director Steve Johnson, Steve Gresko, with a specific language on the amendment. This is a good bill. Good afternoon, Chair Scheibel, Vice Chair Harris, Jennifer Noble on behalf of the Nevada District Attorneys Association. We also support the legislation. We'd like to thank Senator Krasner for working uh, with us and with the Washoe County Forensic Science Division on the amendment, which is up on Nellis, which makes sure that we can further the policy of this bill while not compromising our ability uh, to solve uh, cases on behalf of victims with respect to mixed samples. Thank you. Thank you. And, and I just want to clarify, Senator, that was a friendly amendment, correct? All right, she, she's nodding, so yes, it is a friendly amendment. It's been accepted by the sponsor. Anybody else wishing to testify in support in Carson City? Not seeing anybody, we'll go to Las Vegas. Anybody here to testify in support of SB 321 is invited to the table. I don't see anybody, so we'll go to the phones for testimony in support of SB 321. Thank you, Chair. If you would like to testify in support of SB 321, Please press star nine to take your place in the queue. Tanya Brown, T O N J A B R O W N, advocates for the inmates and the innocent. We support we support this um, this bill with the amendment, and want to thank Senator Krasner for bringing this forward. Have a wonderful day. Thank you. Ashley Spence, SPENCE, -E, DNA Justice Project. Thank you, Chair and committee members. I understand that an amendment has been offered. I have not had a chance to review the amendment, but I am fully in support of a collection of ODNA offender samples. I was a 19-year-old victim of a brutal home invasion rape in Arizona State. He violently raped me for hours throughout the night, and he got away, and I never saw his face. There were no leads. The fear was paralyzing. Seven years later, I received the shocking news. There was a DNA match. He was arrested in California for an unrelated offense, resisted the officer. Thankfully, they have the law that 18 states upon all felony arrest DNA is taken. They uploaded into CODIS, and it hit a match back to my case all those years before. He was a serial rapist with a shed behind his home full of women's underwear and ID cards from all over the world. But we went to trial, and he is now in prison for 138 years. I was fortunate. I have justice. But all victims deserve justice. According to a study by Rain, out of 100 rapes, 97% of rapists go free. This must change. Now, there has been remarkable work on rape kit reform under Senator Krasner and with Joyful Heart Foundation to test, track, count every rape kit. Yet many victims will continue to have justice withheld because of loopholes in the system. We must have the DNA databases working in order to get the matches. Our country is facing a crisis of uncollected offender DNA samples that are required under the state law for inclusion that we're missing. There is a systemic problem of failing to collect and upload them. The U.S. Department of Justice estimates there are between 40 to 50,000 per state. So at a national level, this would mean added up up to 2 million missing offender DNA profiles for qualifying arrests and convictions. Now, regardless of the reason, this is terrifying and this must change because miscollections need missed opportunities and missed opportunities to match these offenders to their unsolved crimes in the database. We need to uncover the scale and the scope of problems so we can work to create solutions and shut down the loopholes in the future. When we enhance the DNA database in a just way, we will not only provide justice, but we will exonerate the innocent and prevent victims of tomorrow. I thank you so much for your time. Chair, there are no further callers to testify in support. 
All right then, we'll move to testimony in opposition to SB 321. Anybody wishing to testify in opposition is welcome to the table here in Carson City or down in Las Vegas. Not seeing anybody, we will go to testimony by phone in opposition to SB 321. If you would like to testify in opposition to SB 321, please press star nine to take your place in the queue. Chair, it looks like we have no callers to testify in opposition. All right, then we will go to testimony in neutral. Anybody wishing to give neutral testimony in Las Vegas or Carson City is invited to the table now. But I don't see anybody making their way to either of the tables, so we will go to the phones for testimony in neutral on SB 321. If you would like to testify in neutral for SB 321, please press star 9 to take your place in the queue. We have no callers to testify in neutral. All right, thank you so much. Do you have any, all right, I'll invite uh, Senator Krasner back to the table for closing remarks. Thank you, Chair Scheibel. I just wanted to say I do accept the amendment submitted by the working group, uh, uh, including the Washoe County Sheriff and Nevada District Attorneys Association and the public defenders from both Clark County and Washoe County, ACLU and Nevada Coalition to End Sexual and Domestic Violence. And I thank you for all of your time today and would appreciate your support of this bill. Well, thank you so much. That brings us to the conclusion of our first hearing. I'll close the hearing on SB 321 and open up the hearing on SB 351. Good afternoon, committee members and Chair Scheibel. My name is Dallas Harris. I represent District 11. Uh, thank you so much for taking the time to hear Senate Bill 351 today. To my left, I have uh, Ms. Vivian Jones, um, who, after I walk through the bill, um, will uh, tell y'all just a little, little bit about herself and why this bill is so important. So um, if I can, I'll ask y'all to just jump in your time machines, travel back about a week, and pretend that the uh, youth legislator Max is here uh, talking about the importance of communication between inmates and their families. That fact uh, is on the record. It's well established. We want people to, to succeed when they get out. Family communication is an essential essential part of that. So please keep that discussion in your mind as we, we go through this uh, hearing today. Uh, so this is probably my shortest bill. Uh, and really it just says that the director should make sure that people with felonies go through the exact same approval process for visitation as people without them. That doesn't mean they'll automatically get approved, but I do hope that it will cut back on how often they are automatically denied for years and years. Second piece says that if someone is denied, that they should get a written explanation. How do you appeal these decisions if you have no idea why they denied you in the first place? So this is really just a small common sense bill that I hope will have a really large impact, uh, especially on families like that of Ms. Jones. And before I turn it over to her, I just want to call the committee's attention to a packet that you have at your desk. It was not uploaded to Nellis because it is very large um, and it does have some confidential information in it. But um, it gives you just a small sense of how often people have to push in order to be able to get their visitations approved um, and to get those appeals heard. Uh, it's just a small snippet of the type of work that organizations like Return Strong do on behalf of these families each day. 
Um, it's, it's pretty frustrating, to put it mildly. Um, and Chair, if it's okay with you, I'll turn it over to Ms. Jones at this time before I take any questions. Oh, hi, my name is Vivian Jones, V-I-V-I-A-N-J-O-N-E-S, and I'm just here on behalf of SB 351. I am a mother of a son that has been incarcerated since the age of 16. He's 36 now, um, 20 years. I haven't been able to see my son. Um, the mental part is, is very hard. Um, I'm just here to say that a physical touch from a mother is important. If you have children, I'm sure you can understand that. Um, my son, I haven't been heard from him in almost two years. I'm just now being able to hear from him because of his mental state now. Um, and I'm also an uh, ex-felon, so that's why I was denied. But my ex-felon is over a decade ago. That's not me anymore. You know, I'm on double jeopardy, you know. So, and also, I haven't even had a traffic ticket in 13 years. I am a law-abiding citizen. Um, I work with the elderly. I am um, very active in my church. I work with prison ministry in my church. I am the president over prison ministry and also hospitality. Um, I'm just asking that I have a chance to be able to see my son before it's too late. And not only speaking on behalf of my son, but every parent that's, that's, that's reached out and have people that are incarcerated. Thank you so much, Ms. Jones. Um, with that, Chair Scheibel, we will stand for any questions on the bill if committee members have them. All right, any questions? Senator Wynn. More of a comment. Um, I, re I really like this bill, and I think it brings some fairness um, to a situation where we have families that are being punished for um, doubly punished, um, and they are not the ones that committed the crime. So I um, just want to put that on the record. Other questions? So, Senator Stone. Yeah. No, thank you for your, your moving testimony. I mean, I, I, I find it extremely alarming that you haven't been able to touch your son or talk to your son and it was over a 20 year period of time does that include video conferencing you were, were you able to see him or write to him was there no communication or um, I haven't been able to my name is Vivian Jones mm -hmm. um, I haven't been able to see my son in 20 years mm -hmm. but he used to call twice a week and during the pandemic um, something took place I don't know what happened to my son but he's mentally ill I don't know what happened. Um, to make a long story short, because it is a long story, um, I was I reached out on every voicemail. I plead. I cried. Everything. Nothing. It took inmates to tell me what happened to my son and what took place with my son. Um, now he's um, he was in EC ECU, which is emergency care unit, for six months, and um, he was let out. And now he's back in there again because I never gave up as a parent. I wrote uh, AG. AG I did a lot, you know. So um, I hope that answered your question. And now I barely hear from my son because he's so highly sedated. So I'm just asking so I could please see my son. Wow. So tell me, tell me the process, if you don't mind, of, of what you have to do to see your son. How many attempts have you made? And and and. What I'm hearing from you is that you're not being able to see your son, not because of the crimes your son committed, but because of a, a crime that you committed almost a decade ago, and you have straightened yourself out and become a model citizen and going to church, and, and you want to see your son. I mean, to me, this is uh, very disturbing. Um, can you just tell us about the process of maybe just a few instances of what you've tried to do to see your son? and, and who is it? To, I mean, does the warden say to find? No, you're not. You're not going to see your son. I just don't understand how that can happen. Sir, I'm not sure either. I'm Vivian Jones. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, I'm not sure either. The um, I filled out. You fill out an application form, and I was denied. You fill out an application form again, and I was denied. And then I put in an appeal. It was denied. Um, I reached out to the warden, Jerry Bean. Um, 
still haven't heard from him since I found out my son was mentally ill. I was begging and pleading and, you know, he told me to send in, you know, some character letters. My, I've done all that. It's been over 60 days. Still haven't heard anything. Um, so at this point, I don't know what else to do, you know, and as far as trying to get in there to see my son. Well, I regret hear, hearing your story, and, uh, your story, and uh, I'm very interested in learning more about this bill because I think it's inhuman uh, that a, a child can't embrace his mother and his mother can't embrace his child. Especially, it's, a, it's a very lonely experience being in prison. Listen, people do crimes. They go to jail. They go to prison. Um, but nurturing by family members can get people back on track and, and getting them the help that they need. I, I can imagine not being able to speak to a loved one and being isolated in a prison for as many years as your son's been there as to why he has mental issues. I, I mean, I, I would have mental issues if I was put in that situation, and there's nothing uh, better than a warm embrace from a parent. So um, God bless you, and I hope we're able to help you. All right, if there are no other questions, we will move to testimony in support of SB 351. Um, if you'd like to give in-person support testimony, come on up to the table in Carson City or Las Vegas. Looks like the Carson City crew is faster today, so we'll start up here. My name is William Connors, uh, W-I-L-L-I-A-M-C-O-N-N-O-R-S. Uh, I was uh, incarcerated in uh, NNCC and Lovelock Correctional Center for 22 years. I got out on January 27, 2001, and I've been doing very well, but I got married to a man in prison. And I love him very dearly, and I would really like to meet him, uh, hug him, and kiss him. But all I get to see him is on the telephone, and that's it. And uh, I, I say did it to everything uh, Vivian said, because uh, that's really what we're about. We're about the touch, you know, about that tactile touch that we, we need between each other. Because without that, uh, I can't look into his eyes. I can't, I can't be there with him. And that's why I married him originally. And I really love him, and I'm really in support of this bill because that bill will get me in touch with him. And that's really what I want. I'm doing very well now out of, out of the prison. I'm, you know, I'm helping other people too. I'm a veteran. I went to a halfway house, had a good time. And people helped me out there, and people in Reno have been very supportive. And it's really nice uh, to get back into the, the swing of things and, and be a good person, and be a good person. And there are people good to me too. And, uh, I just hope that this bill will go through because I really need that connection. I thank you very much for your time. Hi, my name is Sylvia Reyes, S-Y-L-V-I-A-R-E-Y-E-S. I have a son. He's incarcerated in NCC. He's been there four years. Um, I was incarcerated as well. I got out in 2015. I've paid my price to society. I've changed my life. I have a nonprofit. I work with Jody. I work with the community. I help the homeless. I advocate for men coming out of prison. And I've seen the toll that it's taken on my son. He's, uh, he's not happy anymore. Mm, sorry. I'm mean, sad because he just wants to see his mom. You know, and I've paid my debt. I've done what I was supposed to do. I just want to hug my son and see him and tell him it's okay because if I can do it, you can do it. And that's it. Hello, my name is Jody Hocking, J O D I H O C K I N G. I'm the executive director of Return Strong, and many of the families that you'll hear from today, actually, probably most of them are families that are part of our organization. Um, I think one of the things that I just want to like leave you with today is that prison families exist and continue to build connections through the most limited ways possible and you'll see families like Vivian's like Sylvia's who still manage to build connection against every ad and those minutes of being able to like sit down and hold hands across the table are sometimes life-saving for our people that are still inside. 
um, the process is very difficult. Um, you see the packets. We've had, you know, wardens that blatantly refute block our emails when we're requesting help for our families and this bill would go make a tremendous amount of improvement in the system that exists now which is very unfair and so we thank you we thank senator harris for hearing it and we hope to see this in movement and reuniting family soon thank you we are in support of a sb sorry 351. Uh, good afternoon, not morning, <laughs> Chair and members of the committee. My name is Maria Teresa Lieberman Parraga, M A R I A hyphen T E R E S A L I E B E R M A and N hyphen P A R R A G A, Deputy Director of Battleborn Progress, and we support this incredibly important bill. Um, I can't offer anything greater than what you have just heard, but just another factoid, um, there is lengthy research on the positive effects of family visitation, which includes improved behavior and lowering res recidivism. And the studies that we'll mention are included in our testimony that we'll turn in. One study showed that prisoners who did not have family visitations were six times more likely to be reincarcerated than people with three or more visitors and additional studies show that each addi additional visit received during incarceration lowered recidivism rates and uh, however most importantly visitation will maintain those bonds that you have heard of but it will also help for people who end up getting released from incarceration to return to those bonds that have remained strong instead of trying to rebuild them from scratch thank you I hope so you support this bill Thank you for your testimony. We're going to go up to uh, Las Vegas for a few minutes and uh, go ahead whenever you're ready. Hi, um, I'm not sure are they able to hear me. Uh, my name is Tressa, uh, T-R-E-S-S-A, Kenyatta, K-E-N-Y-A-T-T-A. -T -T I have a son that was sentenced to 40 to life with a possibility of parole at the age of 18. I have been denied visitation because I have a past, uh, a charge for possession of marijuana. And um, I have to admit at, at the time my son went in, my life was a model, but now I'm a community health worker, a behavioral health tech. I've obtained my fingerprint clearance card. Uh, I changed my life uh, because I knew my son needed my support. And I know that uh, if I'm able to do it, I am an example and encouragement to him that it can be done. But I haven't been able to see my son in the whole time that he's been there. He's been there, he went in at 18 years old. He is now 34 years old. I wanna hug my son. I am a mother and I don't think that anybody should have the right to take that away for me to be able to go in and see him. I have put in applications and been denied. Um, I've appealed and been denied uh, like the other mother that spoke. And I just want to have this bill passed, not just for myself, but for other mothers that don't know about Return Strong or don't have um, the capabilities of finding help but I want to be able to see my son. I'm 55 years old. I don't, I, I, this shouldn't be my end story that I never get to see my son again. Uh, the only thing I can say, the emotional effects that it's had on me, my life is not the same and it will not be until I see him. And I can't imagine the effects that it has, has had on him. He's sad, he's not the same person. And the only feeling that I can explain to you that can equate it, maybe you can understand if you have a child or if you've lost somebody that you love, it's, it's, that's the only way that I can explain it. It's like, it's like he's dead because I can't see him and I can't touch him. So I want this bill and I am in support of SB 351 and I'm gonna keep find it, fighting until I am able to see my son. I know this is not our end result. Thank you. Hello, my name is Sonia Williams, S-O-N-Y-A 
W-I-L-L-I-M-S. <laughs> I am a community organizer with Return Strong. I also help families with visitation appeals. Um, I can say that ma the majority of our families are denied visitation due to prior felony charges and convictions. When I say charges, I'm talking no conviction included, just been arrested for a felony charge. Um, some of those include like uh, shoplifting, uh, drunk and disorderly, you know, from 1991 type thing. Um, the packet that was submitted, I helped put that together. So it explains a lot as far as decades, 20, 30 years old, old felony charges and convictions being denied repeatedly. They submit the documents, they are still denied. It's, it's a crazy process and it takes months, years to, to even get uh, one, one appeal to be read. Um, NDOC has <laughs> blocked my email, or one warden has blocked my email from submitting appeals on behalf of these people, uh, be, um, on behalf of the families. It, it's, it's crazy. So we thank Dallas, Senator Dallas Harris for presenting this bill, and we are in support. I am in support. Thank you. Hello, my name is Pamela Browning, P-A-M-E-L-A-B-R-O-W-N-I-N-G. I am here today in full support of SB 351, not only because keeping that in-person con connection between family members while incarcerated is very important, but because I too have been affected. I am formerly, formerly incarcerated, whose criminal background is from 20 plus years ago. And I can honestly sit here and say, none of us here today are the same person we were 20 years ago. Having those in-person visits were more important to me because there is nothing like seeing your child smile, hearing them laugh, or just listening to them tell you about what's going on in school. But most of all, the big hug they give you because they're so happy to see you. It really makes you feel like you're still part of their, their life and of the family. It was just as important, it's just as important for families to see, and my family to see me when I was incarcerated, just to be able to look in my eyes and see that I was okay. It was, you know, I, I had an elderly mother, and to be able to look in her eyes and see that she's okay, besides telling me she's okay on the phone, it meant a lot. I have been through extensive background screenings for employment and have never been denied because of my criminal history. I have become a very active member in society with a great career, even my own small business. But the way I changed my life around didn't matter to NDOC. I submitted an application, was denied, submitted an appeal with a full FBI scope background check and was still denied. I really believe that that connection between your loved one and you should continue on throughout their incarceration. Some people will never see their families on the outside again. And to not be able to experience that and keep that bond while they're incarcerated, it tears people down. Thank you. Melissa Duna, M-E-L-I-S-S-A-D-U-N-A. I have a son that's incarcerated at High Desert State Prison. I am fortunate that I am able to visit my son, but I have been very close to all these women here today that are come before you, and I would like to tell you, there is no other happiness for an offender and their family to get that visit, to get that 20 minute hug when you first walk in that door and show that support of love and to encourage your child that they can be the best that they can be and you can turn their life around. And these women are living proof that they have turned their life around. 
The family should not be punished. They are not the ones that are in there serving for whatever reason the offenders are. And I strongly support SB 351. Because, first most, and honestly, the family are the eyes and ears. The families are the one who can express the voices that aren't heard behind them prison walls. Please pass this. And I encourage everybody to put yourself in us, the mothers, the families that suffer right with the offender. And I thank you today for taking your time to hear me. Hello, my name is Tashika Lawson, T-A-S-H-I-K-A Lawson, L-A-W-S-O-N. I am here speaking on behalf of a of a mother that is in in the uh, in the audience right now. Um, she unfortunately can't speak with you today because she is recovering from a surgery, and she has been waiting to the point where her medication has actually worn off. This mother wanted for me to be able to convey the fact that visitations are important, especially when you have young children who are behind the walls. They are in need of see, seeing familiar um, faces in a strange place. This mother has not seen her son since, he, since he, um, her son was 19 years old, and he's been in there for about a year and a half now. Can you put yourself in her shoes? What I'm going through mentally is, is not able to see my son, much less give him a hug. This is cruel, come on, this is cru cruelty. My loved one is already behind bars. Being in this kind of, of environment is punishment enough for a 19-year-old. I have not had, an, a visit, had not had visitation in a year. I am, I am, I was not charged, much less. Um, I, sorry, that this got a little, little thing. But she just wanted to be able to convey that she's, um, she's an active person in the community. She's always there at a drop of the hat when anybody needs help. And currently, she's being punished and denied. Um, her family, her pastors, friends, nobody has been received approval to see to see this young man. She has a grandson that was the happiest one-year-old that you can ever see. And since, the, her, since her son was sentenced, her grandson has stopped talking. He hasn't said a word in almost, um, he hasn't said a word um, until about two weeks ago when he, heard, when he heard this young man's voice at the other end of the call. And then when it was time for them, for him to hang up, it was the first time her grandson spoke and it was to say, no, 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 because he did not want the call to end. This is not, not only messing up people mentally, but this will affect a person's health. My friend has suffered her physically and she is suffering in the audience right now, waiting for a chance to speak to her son on behalf um, of all of the mothers who are out there. She's currently re re recovering from spinal surgery. Um, she's from the East Coast where they use just an ID to be able to visit their loved ones. Please make the necessary changes to the Nevada visitation system. Please stop keeping us away from our loved ones. That's it. Good afternoon. My name is Chris Cavello, K-O-V-E-L-L-O. -L -L -O. I am here in support of, uh, I'm sorry, SB 351. Um, Fortunately, my son was recently released. However, um, he was at High Desert for a while, and he was also at a far camp. I was very fortunate, uh, fortunate mother that got to visit their child, and I visited as often as I possibly could. However, my husband uh, was never permitted to visit um, my son, and that is because he has a felony conviction that is 39 years old. Um, he has an FBI number. He was in the federal penitentiary. His crime was not a violent crime. There was no weapon involved in his crime. That was over 39 years ago. He was denied visitation uh, with our son. But I do want to share something with you. My husband applied with the U.S. Department of Homeland Security for a TSA known traveler number, he was denied. They send him an appeal form. 
which he filled out. I want to hold this up and show this to you. This is dated the 23rd of this month. He received this on Tuesday, telling him that his appeal went through because he provided records that his conviction was over 39 years ago. So if it can be done with Homeland Security, I don't understand why we can't do it for these families that have past convictions and have become productive citizens. Like I said, I was fortunate. My husband was not. But I do want to thank you um, for your time, and I am in support of SB 351. This is Tashika Lawson. I forgot to say that I am um, Tashika Lawson, T-A-S-H-I-K-A Lawson, L-A-W-S-O-N. Um, I am in support of um, Bill 351. Hi, my name is Crystal Voigt, C-R-Y-S-T-A-L, last name V as in Victor, O-I-G-H-T. Uh, first, I wanted to thank you for your time today. I'm here to show you that people who make mistakes can change and deserve a second chance. I had a very traumatic childhood that led me to making the wrong choices and using drugs at the age of 12. I've battled addiction since then. I've had years of sobriety, but I did relapse in 2013. That was the worst I had ever been. I hit rock bottom. I am thankful that it happened because I wouldn't be where I am today. Um, I was sentenced to drug court and probation. I completed drug court and the terms of my probation. And in the last six years, I was able to work my way up from an entry level flagger to a senior engineer at a large construction company. Just last year, I was able to purchase my first home. Three years into my journey, I met my fiance through a mutual friend. He had already been, he had already been incarcerated for four years. We filled a void in each other that we didn't know we had. When we first started talking, he didn't have any hope or influences in life that could show him a life out of crime. And now he's making plans on places he wants to apply at and vacations he wants us to go on. Being with me has shown him a different and healthy way of living, but because of my past, I am unable to visit. We wanna further our relationship and focus on getting him ready to succeed when he is released, but without visitation, we are being held back. I am proof that people can change in their life no matter what they've done in their past. My past shouldn't be held against me, especially when I can help him become a successful citizen of society. I have completed all my requirements and have turned my life around. Again, thank you for your time, and I hope you will take into consideration how visitation will have an, a positive impact on my fiance's success. Good afternoon, my name is Margo Tello, and I am a member of Return Strong, and I also have worked in the criminal justice field for over five years. Research has shown that the importance of having family support in recovery and to reduce recidivism. I have seen that in action in my years working with justice-involved individuals. Having your loved one incarcerated is already traumatic enough for families, and separating families hurts everyone. Allowing families to visit will help individuals during incarceration and will allow them to be more successful when released. I ask that you support Support this bill. Thank you. Hi, my name is Jamie Jerry Figueroa, F I G U E R O A. Um, I'm in support of this bill because I just like everybody else said. It's this family support, the connections, it's very important for anybody to succeed once they get released. Um, my son is incarcerated at High Desert State Prison, and <clears throat> I am also a felon. I got out in 2020. My conviction was 2014. Um, I continue to work the same job. I'm a productive member of society, and I think people like us can show them the way, and they need, they need somebody to show them that they still care, you know, that they're not just tossed away, not just for our loved ones like my son, but I mean, I also have his daughter. She is two and I can't even take her to see, I can't take her to see him because they keep denying me visits. And, you know, she, she also needs to have a connection with her dad. So I just think it's very important that Things have changed for those of us who are convicted felons. We are ex-felons. We did our time, paid our dues, and I think that should be left in the past. If we did our time and that's what we paid our dues, then why are we still being punished? Why are our loved ones being punished? I mean, they're being punished 
for what they did, but we shouldn't be also. Thank you for your time. All right, looks like everybody uh, who planned to testify in Las Vegas has testified. Thank you all for uh, taking the time to be here and contributing your thoughts. We'll come back to Carson City uh, for testimony in support of SB 351. Go ahead whenever you're ready. Thank you, Chair Scheibel and committee members. My name is Nicholas Shepak, S-H-E-P-A-C-K. I am proudly the board president of Return Strong and a steering committee member, member of social workers against solitary confinement. I don't think it can be said uh, any better than it has from the families. I just do want to highlight that in this state, we call our prison system a correction system with a stated goal of rehabilitation. And I don't think it can be understated the hypocrisy and absurdity that is denying someone who has successfully gone through that system, successfully re-entered society, has shown that they have been rehabilitated and who is probably the best resource for their loved one who is incarcerated, denying them the ability to see them. If we believe our system works and we want to use this system, then we should treat the people who successfully go through it the same as we do the rest of us. Thank you. Good afternoon, Chair, members of the committee. Erica Roth on behalf of the Washoe County Public Defender's Office. Um, I did owe the comments of everyone who came before me, and I'll simply add that we are not the sum of our worst decisions, and I urge your passage of this bill. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. John Pure from the Clark County Public Defender's Office. Uh, whenever we represent a client and we know that time is going to be an issue, you always want to make sure that they maintain contact with their family. Uh, hearing some of the stories of the mothers who could not be with their sons, the husband who could not be with his husband, those are heartbreaking stories. This feels almost like a Mr. Gorbachev tear down that wall kind of bill. And so I just urge your passage of this bill. Uh, and I'm, I remain hopeful based on the comments of this committee that we can reach a place where family connections can uh, happen again. Um, good afternoon. My name is Nicole Williams. I'm at uh, Williams W I L L I A M S. I am an advocate and a board member with Return Strong. Um, I'm here in full support of this bill. I'm fortunate enough um, to be able to visit my loved one, but his mother, who's 77, has been denied, um, still hasn't received the letter as to why, and I'm sure when she does, she's not going to know how to navigate through the process. Um, just want to reiterate that um, it's a proven fact that, um, you know, visits and human interaction reduce recidivism rates, and I really can't tell you how important and crucial it is to help keep those important bonds. So um, I really hope that you consider that, and um, once again, I'm in full support. Thank you. Good afternoon again, Chair and members of the committee, Lilith Barron, L-I-L-I-T-H-B-A-R-A-N with the ACLU of Nevada. I echo the sentiments of those before me. I think this is a great chance for us to look at as a state when punishment ends. Is it after someone has served time or is it to last forever? It is incredibly heartbreaking that people who are impacted by this have to come and tell their stories over and over in order to receive justice in any kind. And I urge that you pass this bill. Thank you. All right, thank you. Uh, I don't see anybody else coming to give testimony in support, so we will go to the phone for testimony in support of SB 351. Thank you, Chair. If you would like to testify in support of SB 351, please press star nine to take your place in the queue. Tanya Brown, T-O-N-J-A-B-R-O-W-N, Advocates for the Inmates and the Innocent. We'd like to thank Senator Harris for presenting SB 351. Fantastic bill, let me say. Um, we would also like to echo the previous comments. They're all wonderful comments. It's heartbreaking to hear how families cannot see their loved ones. And it really needs to change. After all, they've committed these crimes 20, 30, 40, 50 years ago. They should be not be denied access to seeing their loved ones. 
in prison. They've served their time. They have become um, hardworking, productive members of society. And just, you know, just for the connection between the, um, the inmate and their loved one is crucial to their mental health and well-being. If you could see, see how these people react the first time they are given that opportunity after they're released, it would go so far if they are allowed to do that while they're incarcerated. Um, and also, I'd just like to mention this. We voted on and allowed those who've been convicted ex-felons to be able to vote. Why can't we allow them to see their loved ones? Please pass this bill, allow their loved ones to go in and give that love and support their family. Thank you. Hello, uh, good afternoon, Chair and members of the committee. Uh, my name is Mark Bettencourt, M-A-R-K-B-E-T-T-E-N-C-O-U-R-T, for the record. Um, I'm here on behalf of the Nevada Coalition Against the Death Penalty. I will echo all of the sentiments that have been shared here today. Um, thank you, Senator Harris, for bringing this forward, and thank you to all of the impacted folks who have shared this trauma that they've experienced for the betterment of their loved ones today. Um, and I humbly urge the uh, committee to support this bill. Thank you. BPS, do we have anybody else on the phone? Hi, yes, my name is Paris. Thank you. P A U R S S, last name Bob, B A U G H. How are you guys doing today? So I am actually um, an ex felon. I do have a significant other that's incarcerated in DOC. Um, I am asking permission for the bill to be passed, and this is one of my reasons. Um, I feel as though as me being an ex felon is hindering me from going to visit. However, I served my time. I did my time and I was, you know, um, given the ability to be released and finish up my parole. And I've been doing good so far in life. Um, when you get out of prison, they tell us they want us to rehabil rehabilitate. And that's what I've done. But also, when you get denied because of your past history, it's like you're still dangling that over our heads. It doesn't matter if it was six months ago, 20 years ago, 40 years ago. We did our time, and we served our purpose, and, and we grew from it. But if we have loved ones that's in the prison system that during their time, I don't feel like we should be penalized because of our past convictions. I am asking for this bill to be considered to be approved because... We have men and women that's in a correctional facility that don't get visits. I am the only person that's in my loved one's life that's willing to come down there and see him. And I'm willing to take the trip. I'm willing to be a part of his life. I'm willing to be that support system that he needs. And since I am unable to see him, the only thing we have is phone. I spend over a thousand dollars a month in phone time. And don't ask me why I spend so much in phone time. It's because I'm a semi truck driver and I stay on the phone all day. But I would like to be able to bring our daughter to go see him. She's four years old and she hasn't seen her daddy since he's been incarcerated be other than CCDC. But since he's been in prison, we're unable to see him. I'm unable to bring her down there to see her father. 
um, it affects me. It affects me like it affects him because it, it, it saddens me that I'm unable to see him. I'm unable to see him because of uh, uh, something I did, you know, and I asked for forgiveness when I went in front of the board. I asked for forgiveness when I did what I did, and I'm, I made my life, I changed the way that I was living. I'm not that person I used to be, but I feel like me getting denied is like I'm I'm that person. Y'all still see me as that person, not the new me, but the old me. So that's it. That's what I want to say. I want to share that. There are no further calls at this time. All right, thank you. We will go to testimony in opposition to SB 351. Anybody wishing to give opposition testimony uh, can come forward in Las Vegas or Carson City. Not seeing anybody, we'll go to the phones for testimony in opposition to SB 351. If you would like to testify in opposition for SB 351, please press star nine to take your place in the queue. There are no there are no callers at this time. All right, we'll take testimony in the neutral position. Hi, good afternoon. It's James Arenda, director for the Nevada Department of Correction. First, I wanted to say that the the language in this is appropriate. Um, however, it's not going to really resolve the issues. Uh, what has to be done is is there's twofold. Uh, administrative regulation under the Department of Correction under 719 is, I think, what really is the, uh, the uh, some of the reason behind this that needs to change. A uh, felony conviction should not be a reason to convict or to continuously to convict somebody so they cannot see their child or their family. However, there are some restrictions on even the felony arrests. You have uh, those that are victims, uh, we do have mothers, fathers, stepfathers, stepbrothers, step uh, uh, family members that are in their PSIs have been continuously raping those individuals that are incarcerated. That would be a reason to deny somebody based on a felony arrest. There are so there are also court orders, um, court orders, separation issues, uh, protective orders, restraining orders that order the Department of Corrections not to allow the visits to occur. The other piece of it is is parole. Um, those that are under parole stipulations, there's stipulations if they have been previously convicted as a felon or out on a felony under parole, they cannot visit in the Department of Corrections. Those are things that need to be addressed. Uh, the issue with the AR Administrative Regulation 719, I am already currently have that in process and I am going to make sure that it's in that process that just because you were arrested on a felony doesn't mean you can't see the individual you want to request a visit for. There's uh, exceptions and exigent circumstances that have to surround it under the felony arrest, as I was mentioning. The other issue that was brought up today, the uh, uh, Miss Vivian Jones, we have been in constant communication through email. Miss Jones was approved for visiting last week. I'm not sure if she claimed she even got that information. Um, that information, uh, she was basically was denied based on uh, some pretty serious felony convictions, um, but it was overridden and she does have visits and she's able to visit on Sunday and Monday of this coming week. Um, so. I do agree the language, uh, just I, it could even be a little stronger. I do believe that the AR-719 really needs to change to uh, take it out that it's automatic of uh, any denial for felonies. It has to be under exigent circumstances, but the issues with uh, the parole stipulations does not fall under my purview. Thank you. All right. I don't see anybody else coming to either table to give neutral testimony. So um, we will go to the phone lines for neutral testimony. If you would like to testify in neutral for SB 351, please press star nine to take your place in the queue. Chair, there is no callers at this time. 
All right. Would you like to make any closing remarks? Yes, go ahead. Uh, thank you so much, Chair Seibel, uh, Senator Harris, for the record, and thank you, committee, for taking the time to hear the bill and hearing uh, the stories of those who were um, brave enough to testify today. Um, I do want to say that I agree with Director Zorinda. This bill does not get us all the way there. Um, and I do trust him to take that ball the rest of the way and implement the regulations as necessary so that he can accommodate for all of those different scenarios um, that he just described. This bill will put that framework in place and allow him to, um, to continue and do it the rest of the way so that we have a, uh, a fair playing field for these folks and, and family members can be able to connect once again. Thank you. Madam Chair. Yes, Senator Stone. Do you mind if I just make a few comments? Not at all. I Go really ahead. Pr I appreciate it. First of all, I want to say to Senator Harris, you know, you, you bring forward some very interesting legislation. <laughs> and I applaud you for bringing the legislation forward. And uh, you have um, really opened my eyes today. And I also appreciate Mr. Zarenda and uh, his comments. Um, this is a big problem in, in my view. Listen, we all understand that people make some mistakes, and some people make some very serious mistakes, and they, they pay the price for their crimes in accordance with the law and our judicial system uh, in the state. Um, but our laws also need to be compliant with the U.S. Constitution. In 1791, 231 years ago, we passed the Eighth Amendment to the Constitution, which forbids cruel and unusual punishment. I think there's cruel and unusual punishment being inflicted on families that cannot see their loved ones, possibly for their entire lives, based on the testimony that I've heard from some people uh, here today. I think it's outrageous. I think it's appalling that a family member cannot possibly see their family member forever. Unconditional love, that's what a mother or a father has for their child, whether their child has done something extremely heinous or not. I put myself in a position that I have four kids. If one of my kids did something absolutely horrendous, ended up in jail or prison for the rest of their lives, I may be the one and only human being that will love that child and will go see that child and be angry with that child for what they did, but they're still uh, my child. Um, in California, we have a prison system that had over 145,000 people in it. Uh, the legislature saw it uh, appropriate to change the name of our prison system to the California Department of Correction and Rehabilitation, right? So um, if these prisoners cannot feel their family's love, it is only going to enrage them fuller, in my view. And when they do get out, they are going to take that anger out and recidivate, and the cycle of going to prison is just going to continue. So I will conclude my remarks by saying thank you for bringing this forward. I would really appreciate signing on to this with you because I support your efforts. I would love to work with the uh, director. I'd like him to outline all the steps that are necessary to make sure that appropriate people can, in fact, see their their relatives, even if they're on parole, if we need to make some changes there, understanding that if there's a crime against that child, that certain person shouldn't be allowed to go see their, their loved one. But I'll close with a favorite song of mine by England Dan and John Ford Coley, Love is the Answer. Thank you, Senator. Thank you, Senator Stone. I really appreciate those comments. And, you know, just for the committee's information, it, it took about 10 minutes after hearing one of these stories to decide that I needed to do something about this. Um, and so this is my effort to um, try and make our state a, a, a little bit better, uh, one bill at a time. So I appreciate your support. Thank you. All right, then I will close the hearing on SB 351 and ask Senator Harris to come back to the dais where I think we might have a motion. I'd so move to do pass. Could, I, could I second that with an amendment? An amendment to the bill? An amendment to the motion. Um, no, we no. can second it. 
I'll second it. I was just going to ask that as a part of the motion, if I could be added as a co-author with the, the legislation. You can be added on the floor. Yes. Thank you. So we have a motion from Senator Wynn to do pass. We have a second from Senator Stone. All in favor, aye. 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 Any opposed? The motion passes unanimously amongst the people here voting. And we will take a 45 second recess. <laughs> and I'm passing the gavel over to Senator Harris. All right, we'll go ahead and open up the hearing on the next bill on the agenda, which is Senate Bill 354. Welcome our esteemed chair to the table. Good afternoon, thank you. For the record, my name is Melanie Scheibel. I am the state senator from District 9 in Las Vegas, Nevada, and I am happy to be presenting SB 354 to you today. It is a um, short bill, and in summary, what it does is it requires justices of the peace to pass an exam called the Multi-State Professional Responsibility Examination. And um, I want to explain a little bit more about what the bill does as well as the purpose of the bill. And um, I think that my, my colleague Elliot Malin is here to, uh, to present with me and he can also provide a little bit of context. So here in the state of Nevada, um, you are, have all become familiar with our court system if you weren't already. We have justice courts um, within the district court system. There's a justice court which handles um, small claims, misdemeanors, and the preliminary hearings for felony cases. Um, so all criminal cases uh, of a felony nature go through a justice court. In a justice court, the judge who sits and presides is called a justice of the peace. A justice of the peace represents the township that they live in, um, which in Nevada, um, isn't necessarily a town in the way that we think of it, um, like Las Vegas or Reno or Elko or Carlin, although it can be. A township is a legal designation within a county. It's a region of a county is a township. And the justice of the peace sits in the township and presides over the justice court. So that justice of the peace, like I said, hears all of the felony cases at the initial arraignment, at the preliminary hearing stage, before it is bound over to district court where someone would be tried in front of a jury. Justices of the peace also oversee misdemeanor violations, um, including bench trials for those misdemeanors. And justices of the peace oversee the small claims courts, um, certain eviction courts, and other, uh, other proceedings depending on the location where they are. For example, in an area that has a municipal court, the municipal court might handle certain proceedings that in a different area, the justice of the peace would handle. So in Nevada, unless you live in a very populated area within a township, that has over 100,000 residents, you do not have to be an attorney to be a justice of the peace. This was a provision of the Nevada Revised Statutes that was changed in the last 20 years. It used to be that you had to be an attorney to be a justice of the peace. This bill is not intended to require all justices of the peace to be attorneys. Let me repeat that. This bill does not require all justices of the peace to be attorneys. The reason that I brought this bill is that I represent clients in criminal proceedings throughout Clark County, throughout our 11 justice courts, in front of 11 fantastic justices of the peace. And my clients are always surprised when they learn if, if they appeared in front of a justice of the peace who's not an attorney. They assume that justices of the peace are attorneys. They assume that the, the person presiding over their criminal case has already demonstrated some kind of knowledge of the law and a qualification to sit on the bench. Uh, we are lucky in Clark County that all of our justices of the peace are in fact very well qualified for the positions that they hold. And this is not an indictment upon any justice of the peace. It's a recognition that as we move forward, 
justices of the peace are going to retire and we are going to have to elect their replacements. And moving forward, we might not be so lucky. So I started talking to my clients, my colleagues, my colleagues at my law, in my law practice, my colleagues here at the Senate, um, my colleagues um, throughout this building, to think about what could we put into place? Something that would be um, not too onerous, that would not require um, reinventing the wheel, and that would not require JPs to be attorneys, but some way to demonstrate their qualifications to sit on the bench. Um, and that's when a group of us, <laughs> I, I honestly, I don't know. I don't know who, who gets credit for this. It may have been Elliot's idea. But basically, if you want to join the bar in Nevada, you have to do a couple of things. You have to go to law school. You have to pass a character and fitness test. The character and fitness test um, is like your criminal background check, and they'll contact your last employers and members of your family and ask if you're a good person and ask if you can uphold the law and things like that. And the State Bar of Nevada administers the character and fitness investigation only for people who are applying to join the Nevada Bar. The other two things that you have to do to become a member of the bar is pass the Nevada Bar, the three-day exam with the multiple choice questions and the essays and um, other various forms of torture, and, um, and complete that with a passing score in order to join the bar. The fourth thing that you have to do, you have to pass the MPRE, the Multi-State Professional Responsibility Examination. The MPRE covers every area of law and reviews the professional responsibilities of every attorney, whether it be the duty that they have to their client, the duty of candor they have to the court, um, the rules regarding handling clients' money or finances, all of that is contained within the MPRE. Um, you do not have to be a lawyer to sit for the MPRE. You do not have to be um, you don't have to pr provide a law school transcript. You don't have to provide uh, proof of a completion of law school courses to take the MPRE. There's no reason that people who seek to become justices of the peace in Nevada could not also sit for the MPRE. In preparation for this hearing, I reached out to the National Conference of Bo Bo Bar Examiners, which is the organization that administers the MPRE. And I did learn that they do generally require somebody to be seeking admission to a bar association in order to take the MPRE. However, that's just a policy that they've put in place um, to, for, for whatever reason, that they're willing to revisit. And so um, there is no legal reason that people who are not intending to become lawyers couldn't take the MPRE. And at this point in time, uh, I'm in, in an ongoing conversation with the National Conference of Bar, Bar Examiners to ensure that their policy will reflect, if we pass SB 354, that individuals in Nevada seeking to become justices of the peace may also sit for the MPRE. Um, there is an amendment to the bill uh, based on a nuance that was brought to my attention um, regarding our most seasoned justices of the peace because the MPRE was not required for admission to the bar in Nevada until sometime in the mid 80s. So we do still have a few sitting JPs who joined the Nevada bar before uh, 1980 when the MPRE was first administered. So they have not passed the MPRE but they are members of the bar. So that subsection 6 allows for those JPs to continue to serve in their roles here in the state of Nevada. And now I'd like to turn it over to uh, Mr. Mallon to provide some additional context, if that's okay with you. Uh, good afternoon, Vice Chair, members of the committee. For the record, my name is Elliot Mallon. Before I really get started, I brought some uh, my nifty Nevada Constitution with me. Um, Article 6, Section 8 of the Nevada Constitution says the legislature shall determine the, the number of justices of the peace to be elected in each city and township of the state and shall fix by law their qualifications. So um, I want to also say I'm grateful to be here alongside Senator Scheibel, who graciously agreed to bring this bill forward. Like I said, Article 6, Section 8, Subsection 1 of the Nevada Constitution vests the power to set the qualifications of justice of the peace in this body in the legislature. 
AB 66 in the 2015 legislative session uh, revisited and revised the requirement to be just of the peace, changing it to be that to permit non-attorneys in counties or townships with a population less than 100,000 to obtain the position. Nevada's justice courts are courts of limited jurisdiction uh, that hear criminal matters, which include traffic violations, small claims, evictions, and civil matters up to $15,000. The justice court also issues temporary and extended protective orders against domestic violence and or stalking and harassment. Nevada is one of eight states that currently allows non-attorney justices of the peace to convict in certain criminal courts. This can also raise some uh, Sixth Amendment right to a fair trial concern for individuals before these courts. Currently in Nevada, depending on the population of your township or county, your justice of the peace may not be an attorney. Their only formal statutory education requirement is to hold a high school diploma. However, there are rules, and I, I thank the stakeholders and the courts for providing these, um, the rules from the court that require justice of the peace to attend judicial college. Within these rules are nothing that requires our justices of the peace to take and pass an exam, showing that they retained a sufficient level of knowledge to adequately address issues before them. We seek to set that standard with a minimal, minimalist approach. Um, it must be noted that this is not an attack on those justices of peace in our rural counties. This is only saying that we should ensure that our citizens, our fellow Nevadans, are protected and given the opportunity to have a judiciary that works for them, a judiciary that they can trust, knows the ethics and law required to make sound decisions on the bench. Today, 27 states permit non-attorneys to be justice of the peace, again, Nevada being one of them. And this bill does not seek to change that. What it intends to do is just establish a minimum level of comprehension of legal ethics at the absolute bare minimum. Nevadans deserve to know that the, those that have the ability to make life-altering decisions for them understand legal ethics. While many have said this bill does not go far enough, and I've heard from a lot of people who are angry that this, has, this didn't require them to be attorneys, I believe that this is a step in the right direction in helping protect Nevadans and making sure that our justice courts in our rural jurisdictions have justice of the peace. And again, let me make this very abundantly clear. This is about making sure that our justice of the peace are able to not only understand judicial ethics, but also spot ethical violations between attorneys and their clients. By having non-attorney justice of the peace take and pass the multi-state professional responsibility exam, we can accomplish this goal. That exam test, uh, tests not only a portion of judicial ethics, but also a wide array of legal ethics that will demonstrate sufficient knowledge of our justice of the peace to better serve all Nevadans. The MPRE is administered by the National Conference of Bar Examiners and is held three times a year. The exam is two hours and consists of 60 multiple choice questions based off of the uh, model rules of professional responsibilities. Um, those that take the exam can have it sent to their jurisdiction or request a score report from the NCBE uh, directly. Uh, it is based, again, on the model rules of professional responsibility and is not a high threshold to learn and pass. The exam does not require any legal knowledge to pass and only requires an understanding of those very rules. Further, if an individual feels that they need a study aid or help, uh, there are available programs for them that will help them obtain the required level of knowledge to pass the exam. Um, I have heard rumors uh, circulating that this amendment would require Justice of the Peace to take and pass the bar. That is not true. I want to make that, again, abundantly clear. We are not setting a standard that they have to take and pass the bar. Just the NPRE. You do not have to be an attorney. In fact, you're not even supposed to be an attorney to be able to take the MPRE today. It is before you even take the bar uh, by about at least a year. Um, we are working with NCBE. Uh, we've had multiple conversations, um, and they've been very gracious in uh, answering a lot of our questions. Um, and again, uh, as Senator Scheibel said, the amendment will essentially waive those who have passed the bar but not taken the MPRE. So those that have passed the bar prior to 1980. Uh, and thank you for hearing this today. Uh, I think this is a, a step forward in helping protect Nevadans across our state. Thank you. Does that conclude your presentation? Yes, I just want to mention also that um, I am open to discussions on this bill and amendments on this bill, and I have been since the beginning. Um, it's just, like I said in my presentation, it's a reflection of a, of a request from my constituents and my colleagues that we put some kind of stand, higher standards into place, and um, I am hopeful that we can do that in this session. All right, committee members, do we have any questions? Senator Stone? Thank you, uh, Chair, Vice Chair. Um, 
two questions. Will this affect uh, existing justices of the peace uh, when their terms are up, when their terms are up, will they have to go take this exam to resume their positions, number one? And number two, this is, uh, I know that there's other states that allow uh, judicial officers to not be lawyers. I find it very foreign in my mind, because in California, not only do you have to be a lawyer or an attorney, but you have to have been a practicing attorney for 10 years before you can be running or appointed to by the governor to a much more simple system, I think, of uh, justice in California than we have here in Nevada. So uh, my second question is, how can somebody with just a high school education adjudicate legal issues without having a formal knowledge of judicial procedures and the laws of a state? I, I find that very troubling. <laughs> Melanie Scheibel for the record, and uh, to your first point, um, I, um, I think it's important to note that we do have requirements for uh, district court judges. They do have to be practicing attorneys for 10 years. Part of the other issue that we're trying to address in this bill is an issue of um, parity between people in different parts of the state because if you do live in one of those more urban areas those justices of the peace have to be attorneys and have to been practicing for five years so we're not talking about just a small difference in the qualifications of justice of the peace in certain nevada cities versus others we're talking about four years of school and five years of practice um, I'm not sure that I can answer your second question. Senator Wynn. Thank you. Um, you know, I, I echo some of the sentiment about concerns about people making these important life-changing decisions um, that have not gone to law school. However, that is the current it's the current state of the law here in our state. I do have some concerns about this because it is a standardized test. It's a multiple choice test. Um, there are many people that I know that are some of the smartest people I know that are in this building, that are in this room, that have not only had to take this exam multiple times, but have also had to take the bar exam multiple times. And so I am I will tell you I'm just a little hesitant to tie that knowledge and that gauge of ethics to like a standardized test. Um, just, I guess that's more of a comment. And then my second thing is, is it just says passing score here. And I just happened to look on the national, um, the national conference of bar examiners and the NPRE. And I've noticed that all but all but one state actually requires this. I think it's Wyoming or Wisconsin. Wisconsin doesn't. Wisconsin and Puerto Rico don't require it. Um, but there are varying levels of scores, Nevada being one of the highest like scores, I think, short of California and Utah. Um, and then there are others. When you are describing a passing score, like is a passing score a 70? Is it, in our state, it's an 85? So I'm curious on that. And then I have another follow-up, but that's okay. Chair. Melanie Scheibel, for the record, um, I'll take your question first and then your comment. Um, the intention is for the score to be the same for justices of the peace as people applying to the Nevada bar. So right now it's 85. If the N Nevada bar were to change that up or down, then the intent is that it, it, this statute would follow suit. As to your comment about having a better way to do this, um, I like I said, I am, I'm open to other options. Um, the reason that we settled on the MPRE, quite frankly, is that it didn't seem fair to put the onus on the state bar to do those character and fitness um, investigations for every person who either um, was elected as a JP or wanted to go get on the ballot as a JP. Um, and so it, it's the MPRE already exists and it and it is standardized which is part of the reason that it makes it easier than putting in a qualification like having good character or um, being knowledgeable of the law if we're not going to require a law degree then um, we have to have some other kind of or the purpose here is to create some other kind of objective measure of their qualifications to understand legal matters and I and I know that the MPRE doesn't understand doesn't test your legal knowledge or legal reasoning or legal capabilities um, but 
anybody who studies for the MPRE um, has to review a whole lot of law. <laughs> and, I, and I think that it does accomplish the goal of ensuring that people have um, invested at least some time and thought into understanding our legal system. And then my, my next uh, kind of question is, and, you know, I honestly don't know and um, don't have any interest in being a judge, but um, I know that in statute, all judges, including those that are elected and um, those that are appointed and those that um, did not go to law school and practice in our, our you know, judges in these jurisdictions where there is this exception, they all have to go to the judicial college. Do you know if there are ethics? I know they teach them some other things, but are there ethics courses and other things that are required? Because I know that is already in statute. So I'm wondering, is that covered in there? Uh, Elliot, for Malin, for the record. So it's not in statute. It's in the court rules. But, um, and, and, and there is a requirement that there is a comprehensive legal ethics portion of the judicial college. However, there is no, nothing to test that knowledge. There's no objective standard at the end, um, as we've seen from what was provided. And that we're just aiming to provide an objective standard. Uh, Melanie Scheibel, for the record, if the judicial college wanted to develop a test at the end of the, the judicial college and um, you know, work with us to write language requiring passage of that test or a certain score on that test, I would be more than happy to work with them on it. And then I guess my final um, question has to do with, um, and maybe you've had these conversations when you've been talking with the MPRE people, it, it, is, is that test something that is geared towards people that do have that like legal like training and you know three years of law school? Or is it a test that, I mean, you had mentioned that they weren't opposed to it. It's just normally, typically, people that have gone to law school that are taking that test. I'm just worried because, you know, unfortunately or fortunately, we have like a situation where you just have to have a high school diploma in order to be a judge in these areas. Are we, would, would, do they need that legal training in order to pass that type of test? Uh, Elliot Mallon, for the record, as somebody that's going to be sitting for the August MPRE, um, no. I, people that take the MPRE are typically currently in law school. Um, they may take a professional responsibility class, which it, New Jersey actually allows them to waive if they've completed and passed a professional responsibility class, which is based off of the, profession, the model rules of professional responsibility. Um, so there is no legal training or requirement there's a there's a i mean the model rules and within the model rules are kind of the treatises as well as practice uh, tests that they can take and i'm sorry one last question if that's okay vice chair um is there a provision of when how like soon after taking the bench or being elected to that process that you have to complete this test and take it. I know you mentioned it was offered three times a year. Um, is there a time period contemplated or is it just during the term of their service? Melanie Scheibel, for the record, it's not contemplated in the bill, but I would be open to clarifying. Additional questions from committee members? All right, not seeing any. We'll go ahead and open it up for testimony then. Anyone here in Carson City who'd like to testify in support of Senate Bill 354, come on up. Ladies first. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Chair, uh, and uh, good afternoon. My name is Maria Teresa Lieberman Parraga, M-A-R-I-A hyphen T-E-R-E-S-A-L-I-E-B-E-R-M-A-N-N hyphen P-A-R-R-A-G-A. And we strongly thank uh, Senator Scheibel for bringing this forward um, because, and I'll keep it simple, we can bring some professionalism to this very important office. And I learned a lot about just how this can affect people's lives. Um, and we need to make sure that we have people that are capable of doing that. And so we encourage this committee to pass this important bill. Thank you. Good afternoon. 
Hi, my name is Lilith Barron, L-I-L-I-T-H-B-A-R-A-N with the ACLU of Nevada. We are in support of this bill. Any consistency within the judicial system is um, welcomed and supported by the ACLU. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon. Um, my name is Ross Olson, R-O-S-T, last name O-L-S-E-N. I'm an attorney here in Nevada, but I am uh, not here on behalf of any client and the views I present are my own. Um, we've had justices of the peace running limited jurisdiction courts in Nevada since at least 1866. In those days, it was impractical to mandate limited jurisdiction jurists be attorneys. Uh, for, uh, for perspective, Nevada's territorial census in 1860 uh, showed a population that was roughly half of the uh, half the number of the approximately 12,000 attorneys that we have today in the state. And further, uh, travel between areas like present-day Yarrington and Hawthorne was exceedingly more treacherous than it is today. However, the laws of our state, the nature of justice courts, the nature of the legal profession, and the technological means available to Nevadans have evolved significantly. We live in a time where justices of the peace must not only make factual findings, but they must make legal decisions that are increasingly complex. Now, thanks to some case law that we have, justices of the peace can even find themselves conducting jury trials, having to make complex evidentiary rulings and crafting jury instructions that can pose challenges to even the most seasoned jurists. Further, travel between areas like Yarrington and Hawthorne or Tonopah and Goldfield are infinitely safer than it was in the 1860s. In situations where rights and freedoms are on the line, whether in justice court or elsewhere, all Nevadans deserve to have their cases heard by jurists with sufficient training and experience in the law to make correct legal decisions mm -hmm. without having to rely on a potentially expensive appeals process to, co uh, to correct avoidable errors. As someone passionate about ensuring our judiciary is equipped to properly protect Nevadans from overreach, whether by our government or our neighbors, I thank Senator Scheibel for bringing this bill. It is a step in the right direction. However, unlike in 1866, we now live in a time where properly trained attorneys, uh, properly trained and experienced attorneys can readily access every county seat, seat in the state. Therefore, I express my support for, AB, er, for Senator, er, Senate Bill 354, but I would also support an amendment that would make the uh, qualifications uniform throughout the state to make, uh, make sure that justices of the peace throughout the state be licensed attorneys with five years experience who are qualified electors. Thank you. All right, anyone here in Carson City, anyone else to testify in support of Senate Bill 354? All right, we will go down to Las Vegas. Anyone in Las Vegas to testify in support of Senate Bill 354? Okay, BPS, can you please check the phones to see if there's anyone who'd like to testify in support? Thank you, Chair. If you would like to testify in support of SB 354, please press star nine to take your place in the queue. Thank you, um, Madam Vice Chair, members of the committee. This is Chris June Kiliani, G I U N C H I G L I A N I, speaking in support of Senate Bill 354. It's a good start, um, at least to put some standards in. I personally believe we should go back to requiring um, uh, JPs to be licensed attorneys. But until that occurs, I think this is at least a step in making sure that they have some um, background. Um, I would ask that you look at section one and after the word candidate, insert or appointee, because we're finding that because the term appointee does not exist in some of the statutes, um, there's a, been some that have taken the position that they're not subject to anything. Um, you might want to also look at requiring background checks if they're not a licensed attorney, because apparently that's done if you are a licensed attorney, but if you're not, you really should have your background check. We do it for school board members. We require training for them within, I think it's six months. Um, they have to take a certain amount of coursework. So I think that that's another area that could be looked at within here. 
And finally, I would ask that if it's not appropriate for this bill, that maybe the AOC should determine and establish a standardized application that has to be used for all judicial appointments. Um, currently, it's done all over the, the roadmap. And an example would be recently in Nye County, they just simply had to send in a letter of interest. There was no background to make sure that they were qualified electorate. They did not check addresses and residency and nothing. And so I think the AOC really, for the purposes of judicial or, or justice, should be consistent across the state of Nevada. Um, I do think that there should be a development of a test after the ethics for any of the judges. Um, maybe the Judicial College could take a look at, at coming up with that. And then in lieu of making them into licensed attorneys, add the ethics component as a, a part of the training. But this is a good start. Um, I, I wish uh, the Senator good luck with it, and thank you for your consideration. Good afternoon, Chair and members of the committee. For the record, my name is Erika Castro, E-R-I-K-A-C-A-S-T-R-O, and I'm the Organizing Director with the Progressive Leadership Alliance in Nevada here in support of SB 354. Regardless of where you live in the state, you deserve the same level of justice. Everyone who goes before a judge should trust that they are going to be before someone who is knowledgeable of the law, responsible, and ethical. SB 354 is a step forward towards this goal, and we urge your support. As a long life Nevada, I hope that you can support this sound policy. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Donna Armenta, D-O-N-N-A-A-R-M-E-N-T-A, on behalf of the Creditors' Rights Association of Nevada, known as CRAN. CRAN is a trade group of attorneys who represent creditors in all courts in Nevada, from, from Main Street to Wall Street, from Justice Court to the Nevada Supreme Court. Our work takes us in all jurisdictions in Nevada for civil hearings. CRAN supports SB uh, 354. The purpose of the MPRE is not to gauge an individual's personal, personal ethics, but instead to measure the test taker's knowledge and understanding of already established standards of professional conduct um, of, of their courtroom. As such, passing this test will give public confidence that all judges in Nevada have the required knowledge of standard professional conduct already in place and will give confidence that the rulings will be based upon ethical standards. Um, and we urge you to please support SB 354. There are no further callers at this time. All right. Uh, we will go ahead and go then here to Carson for opposition testimony. Yeah, come on up. If you want to testify in opposition, please grab a seat. Uh, don't forget to state your name for the record. Thank you. Good afternoon, Senator Harris. Thank you, members of the, the committee. My name is Richard Glasson. It's spelled G-L-A-S-S-O-N. I'm here today in opposition to Senate Bill 354 because the MPRE, the multi-state professional responsibility examination is irrelevant to most of the work that's done here by our judges. I do so in respect of the separation of powers, respect for the judicial branch and access to justice for all. I'm appearing on behalf of my association, the Nevada Judges of Limited Jur This is a joke chair, isn't it? <clears throat> I appreciate the humor, thanks. Um, the, it's also called the Nevada Judges Association, the NGLA. We represent all municipal court judges and justice court judges in the state of Nevada. This includes justices of the peace in those townships in Clark County, and I don't have my atlas with me, but from my memory, there are non-attorney judges in many of the townships in Clark County, including Laughlin, Moapa, Searchlight, Alamo, Caliente, um, possibly more. 
I'm a member of the Nevada Bar. I'm a member of the California Bar. I sit on the Character and Fitness Subcommittee of the Nevada State Bar Association Admissions Committee. I am an alternate member of the Nevada Commission on Judicial Discipline. I'm past president of our association. I've been recognized as Judge of the Year and I've received the Lifetime Achievement Award from the NJLJ. I've recently received from the Supreme Court the Judicial Education Distinguished Faculty Certificate, which is hanging in my 93-year-old mother's living room proudly. I instruct on judicial ethics and judicial conduct for judges and court staff. I've been doing that for 18 years. My association represents all the municipal and justice court judges here in Nevada. Many of us serve in rural communities who do not have an abundance or a single lawyer that wants to run for our job. So many of us are not members of the bar. We've not taken the lawyer's MPRE, which is not an ethics examination. It's an examination on the rules of professional conduct for lawyers. That's in this blue book. Um, and it's a nice book, but there's the annotated code of judicial conduct for judges is what we abide by. It's like two different religious texts for two different completely different religions. We're not supposed to be lawyers. We're supposed to be acting as judges, not as lawyers. Attorney ethics are largely not relevant to judicial ethics. Now, constitutionally, since 1864, the education, the training and qualification of municipal court judges and justice of the peace has been directed by the Nevada Supreme Court. And for at least the last half century or so, the Nevada Commission on Judicial Discipline. Out of respect for our Supreme Court and the judicial branch, this legislature set minimum standards for municipal judges and justice court judges. A muni judge only has to live in the city and register to vote. A justice of the peace at least has to have a high school diploma. Then after appointment or election, the Supreme Court and the Commission on Judicial Discipline takes over for our education and discipline. Here's something from the Nevada Supreme Court's Judicial Education Unit. They note that, quote, the task of maintaining judicial competence depends on the willingness of the judiciary itself to assure that its members are knowledgeable and skilled in the study of law, study of law and its development, and that judges are trained in the application of legal principles and the art of judging to provide accurate and timely services to the public. Proper administration of justice can be accomplished through education. It increases efficiency, innovation, and effectiveness for the benefit of the people of Nevada. Judicial education is a primary means of advancing judicial competency and building public trust and confidence in our judiciary. Continuing judicial education requirements are mandated by statute and Supreme Court order for all Nevada judges including those approved by the Judicial Council of the State of Nevada. Additionally, there are continuing legal education requirements for attorney judges to maintain the Nevada Bar License. Those separate requirements are mandated by the State Bar of Nevada." Close quote. Now, initially upon appointment or election, two weeks of concentrated judicial code of conduct and judicial education at the National Judicial College are required right over the hill here in Reno. A second judicial ethics course is required within the first two years on the bench. We all undergo annual continuing judicial education for everything from ethics to evidence, but always on ethics. In addition, our education has other subject areas. We have subject areas for the just the peace, different than lawyers, orders of protection. We don't need to know about the ethics for divorce. We study the Confrontation Clause, not corporations. We test on protection orders against domestic violence, not probate. I see lawyers in court every session who know little or nothing about the Nevada Code of Judicial Conduct. Their knowledge of the MPRE. Sir, we generally have a two minute testimony time limit. We have not put that on, but I'm hoping we can wrap your testimony up shortly. If you have written testimony, you can, you can submit that, but I'll just ask you to summarize quickly, please. Thanks.
This bill requiring passage of the MPRE for lawyers is an intrusion on the traditional oversight of judicial legation by the judicial branch. The lawyer, excuse me, the judge questions on the MPRE are not for judges. They're for law students who want to work for judges. The, I was given a, a chance to look at what the MPRE says today about non uh, law school applicants attempting to take the exam. The MPRE is designed as one part of the professional legal licensing process. It is not intended to be taken by people who are not planning to use the score to apply for admission to the bar. Beginning in 2020, National Conference of Bar Examiners policies require candidates to certify that they are taking the MPRE for the sole purpose of admission or readmission to or retaining status as a member of the bar of a, of a participating jurisdiction. In the last 20 years, only 15 non-attorney judges have been written up by the Nevada Commission on Judicial Discipline as compared to 55 lawyer judges. The bill, I don't want to work for a judge. I am a judge. I teach judges. I've never taken the MPRE. Neither did Chief Justice Hardesty or Chief Judge Gibbons of the Nevada Appellate Court. After, as of this afternoon, the MPRE is not open to non-law students, but maybe the MPRA approval is just a phone call away. We're not going to find competent citizens to sit in our townships, in these small townships and rural townships, if they have this type of a burden. This sudden intrusion into the way that we've been running our state judiciary for the last 150 years is going to create chaos. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> Uh, thank you, Vice Chair Harris, members of the committee. <clears throat> For the record, my name is John McCormick. Uh, last name is M-C-C-O-R-M-I-C-K, Assistant Court Administrator at the uh, Nevada Supreme Court's AOC. Here to just put a couple concerns we have regarding this measure uh, on record and indicate that we uh, look forward to working with Senator Scheibel going forward. Uh, our concerns are that we are not necessarily sure that the MPRE is the correct instrument uh, to gauge just the peace qualifications. Um, and uh, I have been researching that issue. I haven't found too much. I think Kansas has a test, so I'm trying to get a copy of that. Um, but, uh, and also, uh, to sort of echo, echo what Judge Glasson said, we have some concern about maintaining adequate access to justice in rural jurisdictions, as there are a number of rural jurisdictions that don't necessarily have a whole lot of attorneys there, uh, nor attorneys who are gonna want, want to run for judge. All right, um, we'll go ahead and go down to Las Vegas for anyone who'd like to testify in opposition to uh, Senate Bill 354. <laughs> That's it. Thank you, uh, Vice Chair Harris. Uh, my name is Victor Miller, V-I-C-T-O-R-M-I-L-L-E-R. -L -L -E I'm a 42-year uh, member of the State Bar of Nevada. I am also a municipal judge and justice of the peace in Boulder City, Nevada, and Boulder Township. Uh, I've been a judge, limited jurisdiction judge, for 39 years. Uh, currently, I am president of the Nevada, of Ju Nevada Judges of Limited Jurisdiction Association, and of that association, there uh, approximately 40% of that association are non-law-trained -law um, uh, judges. Uh, even in my neck of the woods in uh, Clark County, of the 11 justice courts, five of those courts are presided over by non-lawyer judges. Uh, those townships, as I've experienced, uh, meeting and, and discussing and, and actually sitting in those courts uh, uh, as uh, substitute judges when they're not available. Uh, as far as I can tell, there's not an attorney in, in those five townships uh, 
let alone an attorney who would want to run for the position who doesn't have other things they're doing with their lives. Uh, if that, that experience has led me to, to see that uh, these non-lawyer judges are capable and professional, uh, even as uh, Senator uh, Scheibel indicated, there's no current um, judges that uh, are causing concern. So uh, it, it leads, that begs the question, if there's not a problem, why are we trying to find a solution? At any rate, I believe that uh, this uh, measure would seriously affect the um, access to justice throughout the state. There are many places in the state where uh, a victim of domestic violence wants and needs a protective order, and if there's not a local judge that they can go and get that, they would have to go a long ways. Even in my little town in Boulder City, it's uh, 30 miles to go into district court to get a protective order. Um, usually a vi uh, someone who is a victim of domestic violence Oftentimes, the perpetrator has control of the car, uh, so there is actually, they'd have to ask the perpetrator, may I borrow the car to go get a protective order against you, uh, which is, you know, having justice available in your community is important. Additionally, not uh, unclear in this uh, uh, bill is how would this affect pro tems, uh, judges that would sit uh, to cover the courts when the judge is not available. Uh, do they, would they need to be uh, so qualified by taking the MPRE, which would again seriously affect the access of justice? Uh, pro tems are important now because as you know, we uh, sir, are I'm gonna, doing, I'm gonna make a similar request. If you could please uh, summarize your, your ending, that would be great and uh, also submit uh, your written com comments for the record if you have them. We are short on time, although every word you're saying is valuable. Thank you, Senator Harris. Uh, I will do so. The, uh, so the, um, we have to sit as judges uh, and review uh, pretrial uh, custody status within 48 hours and so that is in need, we are need, in need as judges to have uh, pro tem judges that are qualified to sit for us. The additional question or comment I would make is that uh, why the MPRE uh, is, my investigation showed that 2%, 2 percent, 2 to 8 percent of the test has to do with judicial ethics and as Judge Glasson said that's lawyers understanding judicial ethics. Uh, there has to be a better way, and we'd be happy to work with Judge Scheibel, our association, or excuse me, Senator Scheibel, uh, our association to, uh, to work and find a better way, find out what the concerns are in a better way. I do not believe that the, the MPRA, MPRE is the way to do that, and hence we are in opposition to this bill. Thank you. All right, thank you. BPS, can we go ahead and check the phone, see if there's anyone who'd like to testify in opposition to this bill? And sir, if you could turn off your mic in Las Vegas. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. If you would like to testify in opposition for SB 354, please press star nine to take your place in the queue. We have no callers at this time, Chair. Okay, we'll go ahead and bring it back here for any testimony in the neutral. Anyone want to testify in the neutral position in Carson City? Not seeing everyone, anyone, so we'll go down to Las Vegas. Anyone like to testify in the neutral position? Okay, not seeing anyone either. And BPS, quickly, can you just check the phones for us? like to testify in neutral, please press star nine to take your place in the queue.
Hello. Um, this is Judge Harrington from Curry County. Um, um, it's H-E-R-R-I-N-G-T-O-N. And I uh, have to apologize. I was pressing star nine uh, when they asked for opposition, but um, I wasn't getting picked up for some reason. But um, I am uh, call, I am testifying in opposition. I'm a, a non-law trained judge from Story County. I sit on the Virginia Township Justice Court. Uh, I've been on the bench for 11 years. I was initially elected in 2012. At the time of my election, Hello, um, this is Judge Harrington from Story County. Uh, um, and sorry, I'm getting a little bit, bit of feedback, but um, before even uh, being elected, I had over 30 years of experience in the legal field, and I worked for three district attorneys, several different attorneys. I won a couple of awards for victim uh, units in uh, Story County, and since um, taking the office, I've developed a pretrial and alternative sentencing unit, and um, I've uh, been the recipient of the 2020 uh, Certificate of, Adva of Advanced Achievement of Judicial Education. I'm opposing this bill, and um, I believe that there needs to be a lot of discussion done about incumbent, incumbent judges who have demonstrated professionalism and ethical behavior um, on the bench already. Thank you. All right, thank you. Um, we'll go ahead and close the hearing then on Senate Bill 354. And for those of you who have ever seen growth in infrastructure, we're going to have to run uh, the next couple of hearings like I tend to run growth, which is very quickly. Um, so we're going to limit testimony to two minutes for the remainder of the bills. And let's see how quickly, but thoroughly we can get through these next couple of hearings. I'll invite our chair back up uh, and open up the hearing on Senate Bill 382. Thank you, uh, Senator Harris. For the record, I'm Melanie Scheibel, State Senator from District 9. Happy to be, well, I'm happy to be in front of you. It's unfortunate we have to introduce SB 382 to do our favorite thing, which is correct an error that we made in the last session. Um, and the error was not in um, anybody's intent or in the idea that we had last session, but um, in an unintended consequence. So back in 2021, when we were um, doing all kinds of great work to ensure that kids in the criminal justice system were treated fairly, we um, added a provision to statute allow, allowing or requiring that if a child was the adverse party in a, protect, in a protective order hearing, that that child would be afforded an attorney um, to represent them in that TPO hearing. The unintended consequence was that we created a power imbalance between people seeking TPOs and people who were the adverse parties in TPOs when those people are minors. And um, if there is any time in which it is you know, most important to have a focus on victims and to protect their rights and ensure a fair playing field, it's when we're talking about children. And so um, you see at the table with me today, Reagan Comis, who is of course um, a friend and colleague who we all know from her excellent work in this building throughout the years. And she also has a personal story to share with you about how um, this unintended consequence can have some very serious and lasting effects on our kids. When um, you have two kids who are involved in an incident like Reagan will describe, and um, the time comes for a TPO hearing in front of a judge, and one child, the child against whom the TPO is being sought, is represented by a lawyer, and the other child, the child who is the victim of the crime and who is seeking that order, does not have a lawyer for them. Um, and so I have worked uh, with the Coalition to End Sexual and Domestic Violence, the District Attorneys Association, the public defenders, to come up with a solution to the problem. And the solution that we came up with was to um, change that decision we made last session so that um, children in TPO hearings are no longer guaranteed an attorney and because we are doing that, we are also providing in statute very clearly in section line 42, 
on the second page that anything that is said in the TPO hearing cannot be used in a criminal proceeding. So um, I think this strikes the balance between ensuring that there is parity between the parties during the TPO hearing and also doesn't open a child up to additional criminal liability based on what they may say during a TPO hearing. And with that, I'd like to turn it over to Reagan. Thank you, Sandra Scheibel, Madam Vice Chair, and members of the Judiciary Committee. Reagan Comas with r, &R Partners, but um, as Sandra Scheibel stated, I am here in my own capacity and just want to share with you why I think this legislation is so important. My daughter was the victim of a crime at the hands of another minor. We sought a protection order for her safety and were told that she would only need to inform the court that there was a pending criminal proceeding and that the extended protection order would be granted. This is what I told her as her anxiety began to increase leading up to the hearing, knowing that she would have to see him on Zoom. As the hearing started, we were asked if our attorney was present. I informed the court that I did not know that an attorney was necessary, and the courtmaster said it was not. Then the public defender, that was assigned to the adverse party announced herself. Instantly, my daughter grew tense and was afraid that he had an attorney and we did not. Then the courtmaster swore us in and began to interrogate my daughter. She was asked question after question and required to provide very graphic details about what happened to her far beyond what she was prepared or expected. The other minor, never had to say a word because their public defender spoke on their behalf. While the order was granted, this had much larger effects on my daughter. For days after, she was unable to sleep because the nightmares that had started to go away, I'm so sorry, came back. She was unable to eat and her anxiety was so bad that she wasn't able to go to school. The lesson that she took away from that day was that the system cared more about protecting her attacker than making sure that she had protection. He had someone to speak for him. While at 14, she had to stand alone. Due to this experience at the protection order hearing, she was too afraid to testify in the criminal proceedings. And due to that, he pled to a lesser charge. I'm asking this committee for the support of this bill to restore the balance in these proceedings so a child petitioning for protection from another child has an equal standing in these civil cases. I'd like to thank Senator Scheibel for her support in bringing this legislation forward, as well as the other stakeholders that work together to bring this legislation forward. Thank you. Thank you. Committee members, any questions? Can I just oh, add, yes. sorry, I there's also Senator, a friendly amendment online um, that reflects that the, uh, the prohibition on utilizing anything said in the hearing applies to both parties. So um, whether you're the victim seeking the order and say something about the crime or you're the person against whom the order is being sought, whatever is said in the TPO hearing can't be used in the criminal hearing. All right, questions on the bill as drafted or the amendment? Uh, Senator Dondero Loop. Thank you very much, Madam Chair, Vice Chair. Um, I, I just have one question. So, and just because I'm not an attorney, but I am a mother of daughters, so <laughs> I feel the pain, um, and granddaughters. Um, it, would, this, it, would, would this fix in this bill, um, Senator, be just for us to say that both parties can have an attorney? And with that being said, if did I understand you to say that the other person, the perpetrator, if you will, um, had a public defender? So would that be incumbent upon the other parent to pay for that attorney? Melanie Scheibel, thank you for the question because this, in fact, was our first thought as well. If we're going to appoint an attorney for the adverse party, we should be appointing attorneys for the party seeking the protective order as well. The issue is that a protective order hearing is a civil proceeding, not a criminal proceeding. And 
not only is there not a constitutional right to the appointment of an attorney in a civil proceeding, um, we, the stakeholders could not identify a pool of attorneys that could and would be appointed for the, um, the party seeking the protective order. In the criminal justice system where um, one person is being prosecuted, um, we often look to the prosecutors as the representative of the victims, but legally they do not represent a victim in a court proceeding. They represent the state. And so they cannot provide that victim with legal advice. So um, they can do things like, I think this is what happened in your case, the, the district attorney's office can tell the child and their parents how to apply for protective order, but can't represent them in that proceeding. So we, I think, all the stakeholders also agree it'd be great to be able to provide an attorney for that victim in that proceeding at the expense of the state, but you can't appoint the DAs, you can't appoint the public defenders because they're representing the adverse party. And so you would have to either develop a whole new system of volunteer attorneys or conflict attorneys. Um, and it was not a viable, um, option, frankly, to develop that kind of program to appoint attorneys for um, people seeking temporary protective orders. So follow up, Madam Vice Chair. So there wouldn't be anybody down in a family court setting that could help. Melanie Scheibel, for the record, um, certainly there are qualified attorneys in a family court setting, but kind of like when you go to file for a divorce, you don't get appointed an attorney. It's up to each side to hire their own attorney. Um, and each one has the right to an attorney, but there are no attorneys paid for by the state, either employed by or paid for by the state that represent people in divorce cases, custody cases, um, or sure. temporary sure. protective orders. And I, and I don't have a problem uh, what I was worried about is that we were appointing an attorney who was being paid for, for the perpetrator, if you will, and it might be a boy or a girl, and um, and we weren't doing the same for the other side because, um, you know, it, it all works well when it's not your kid. That's what I always say. I say that a lot around here. It's always great when it's not your kid, but when it's your kid, it feels different. And some of us may very well be able to afford that attorney, but it would be very often that somebody could not afford that attorney or know anything about the legal system to do this. And by the way, it could be two girls, it could be two boys, it could be boys and girls, right? It could be lots of mixes of things. But um, I do think that um, it, the, the idea warrants some further conversation to see if we can figure out a way that we can make this work for chil the children, right? Not, not for the legal system, not for family court, not for whoever, not even for the perpetrator or the, or the, um, the victim, but for the kids, because they're kids. <laughs> and Chair Scheibel, if I may, I'll just throw out that legal aid often does pick up some of this work whenever we put the requirement that um, uh, that there be some type of counsel, although uh, legal aid is packed at the moment and would likely need some substantial resources in order to be able to provide a guaranteed attorney for every victim who is every minor victim who is seeking a TPO, but they already do minor guardianships, they do adult guardianships and other things. So uh, maybe in the future, that is an avenue to explore. Um, and, and Reagan Comas for the record and Senator Dondero Loop, I think that was my concern as well in, in looking at the legislation, the fact that currently the adverse party has a public defender for them. Had my family known that that was going to be the situation, we are of enough means, fortunately, to be able to, to have possibly, I don't know even what attorney we would have found to come for a protection order hearing. But what about the other children that do not have their families do not have the means or they don't have the ability to get an attorney to represent them that's the balance that we're trying to solve by just saying that the the adverse party doesn't automatically have an attorney as well Go ahead. and if I could just add Melanie Scheibel for the record and I agree and I would 
also welcome a continued discussion on developing a system where we can appoint attorneys. But in the meantime, I do think it's important that we fix the power balance going immediately forward. And this is the way that we can do it today. All right, I'm going to assume there are no more questions from committee members. Okay, let's go ahead and move on to testimony. Anyone here in Las Vegas like to testify in support of Senate Bill 382? Great, don't forget to state your name for the record. Dos minutos, por favor. Thank you, Vice Chair, members of the committee. I will do you one better than two minutes, but <laughs> my name is Serena Evans. I'm the Policy Director for the Nevada Coalition to End Domestic and Sexual Violence. Just want to go on record and say we are in strong support of this bill. We thank the Senator for working with us and other stakeholders in the interim, and would like to thank Reagan for her vulnerability and sharing a little bit about her family's experience. Um, this bill is necessary just to remedy the power imbalances, and we urge its support. Thank you. Okay, anyone in Las Vegas who'd like to testify in support of Senate Bill 382? Not seeing anyone. BPS, can we check the phones, please? You would like to testify in support of SB 382. Please press star 9 to take your place in the queue. We have no cause to testify in support at this time. All right. Anyone here in Carson City would like to testify in opposition to Senate Bill 382? Not seeing anyone move. How about down in Las Vegas? Anyone to testify in opposition? Okay. BPS, can we check the phones one more time, please? If you would like to testify in opposition of SB 382, please press star 9 to take your place in the queue. We have no callers to testify in opposition. Okay, anyone in the neutral position? No one here in Carson. Anyone in the neutral position in Las Vegas? Not seeing anyone move. BPS, can we check the phones for neutral, please? If you would like to testify in neutral position for SB 382, please press star nine to take your place in the queue. We have no callers to testify in neutral. All right, let's go ahead and close out the hearing then on Senate Bill 382, and we will open up the hearing on Senate Bill 414 and welcome back our chair. Thank you so much, uh, Melanie Scheibel, for the record, uh, presenting uh, Senate Bill 414. And um, this bill, very simply, requires that all calls to incarcerated people at the Department of Corrections be free of charge. So we can go back in time to our first hearing where we went back in time to our hearing with um, Youth Legislator Greenstein and um, I'll be blunt and, and I'll be quick about this. Basically, um, these two vehicles, th these two bills have a similar purpose, but they're very different policy decisions. And um, throughout the interim, as I've engaged in discussions with affected people, um, formerly incarcerated folks, people with incarcerated loved ones. Um, we have not come to a consensus on what the best policy is, and so that's why we come to the legislature and say, one policy option is to utilize the proceeds from the calls that we do charge for in order to make calls between parents and their kids free, or an alternative is SB 414, where we utilize an appropriation to cover the costs of all phone calls within the Department of Corrections. And so I think that it is a worthwhile use of our state funds to ensure that people who are incarcerated and are unable to work and make money can still have contact with their families who are um, living outside of that incarceration setting. And I don't think I need to belabor the importance of being able to talk to not only your child, but your parent or your sibling or your spouse or, or your step-sibling or your friend or your um, business partner or anybody else who um, your accountant. You can talk to your lawyer for free already, but there may be other people um, outside of the, the prison who are important in your life, or in an incarcerated person's life, that they should be able to speak to for free. And that is what this bill would do. And I'm happy to take any questions. All right, committee members, questions on free calls? 
Not seeing any, we'll go ahead and open it up for testimony. Uh, if you'd like to testify in support of Senate Bill 414, come on forward and take your seat. Chair, may I be excused? Absolutely, Thank Chair. You. Thank you, Vice Chair Harris Committee members. My name is Nick Sheepak, S-H-E-P-A-C-K, State Deputy Director of Fines and Fees Justice Center. I will be brief here. Um, we believe that essential services that the government provides, especially ones such as phone calls that lead to uh, very good outcomes, should be funded through the general fund and not through user fees, especially by families. The one thing that I do want to highlight about this bill is that it, when it talks about communications, it touches on what I have the biggest fear moving forward is, which is um, email communications on the new tablet systems if we bring those out and states like New York they charge at least 35 cents an email that goes up depending on the length of the email these are often used like text messages good morning you know how are you doing uh, the cost for families and um, incarcerated individuals in some of these states has been uh, extreme with those systems and I think we should get out ahead of that and for that reason we are in support of this legislation Thank you, Madam Vice Chair. John Pure from the Clark County Public Defender's Office. We're all for reducing the cost of connection. Thank you. Okay, anyone in Las Vegas like to testify in support of Senate Bill 414? Go ahead and uh, don't forget to state your name for the record. Two minutes, please. Hello, my name is Pamela Browning. I just want to state I am in full support of SB 414. Um, I did um, support Max's bill also. I do spend about $450 a month on the phone, not just for me, not just for his kids, but people say, make sure you give him this message. Can you tell him this? Can you tell him that? So to have full access to anybody that cares about you um, through phone calls, um, I think would really um, help not only families, but the, our loved ones incarcerated. Thank you. Melissa Duna, M-E-L-I-S-S-A-D-U-N-A. -S -S I fully support SB 414. Um, it is a good thing. I feel offenders should be able to make a phone call on a holiday, Thanksgiving. Maybe he wants to call an aunt or an uncle or somebody besides a mother or a father that they speak to on a regular basis that pays for their calls. Um, I think it's very good for uh, their mental health, and I really hope you consider passing SB 414. Okay, thank you. Looks like we have another person. Go ahead and uh, testify when you're ready. Hello, my name is Margot Tello. I am here in support of this bill. Um, you know, these charges can add up and it definitely affects those with limited means. So this is an opportunity for them to continue to communicate with their loved ones. Thank you. All right, thank you. Let's go ahead and go to the phones, BPS, see if there's anyone who'd like to testify in support of Senate Bill 414. If you would like to testify in support of Senate Bill 414, please press star 9 to take your place in the queue. Tanya Brown, T-O-N-J-A-B-R-O-W-N, Advocates for the Inmates and the Innocents. We strongly support SB 414. Um, I would like to say that, uh, well, as you know, um, it is very important to have, keep that communication open. Um, I will say that something that hasn't touched on, and I'm speaking from a personal experience, when my daughter and her friends were thrown into a horrific situation in the middle of Washoe Valley about 20 years ago, there was nothing that I or the other girl's parents or even the professionals that they went to see could do anything to help them what they were going through. They had put where they were, uh, pressure was being put on them by the community, by the district attorney's office. Um, some were suffering from the anxiety, depression, PTSD, and su suicidal tendencies. And it was with the help of their loved one who was incarcerated who was able to get them through this. And that's what I mean. To keep this open, the, the, the open, the doors of communications for all family members, because you never know who is struggling from suicide depression, and how that one person who is incarcerated can make the huge difference in one's life. Thank you.
there are no further callers. All right, thank you. Anyone here uh, in Carson City would like to testify in opposition to Senate Bill 414? No movement. Uh, anyone in Las Vegas in opposition? Not seeing anyone, BPS. Let's check the phones quickly, please, for anyone who'd like to testify in opposition to Senate Bill 414. If you'd like to testify in opposition of Senate Bill 414, please press star nine to take your place in the queue. We have no callers, Chair. Okay, we'll take uh, neutral testimony here in Carson City. Looks like we have uh, Director Zorinda with us. Hi, uh, James Zorinda for the record, Director for the Nevada Department of Correction. There's just two concerns that I have with this bill is, is if we do not get the appropriation is one of them. Uh, currently, the revenues that are cost that come out of the phone communications pays for 28 statewide staff, addiction service programming, um, and other programmings that would not exist if it was not appropriated services. So I'd be really concerned that the offenders would not be getting the appropriate services if the money was not there for them. Uh, the other thing is too, we allow three, uh, majority of the facilities are three 15 minute phone calls a day. Um, if they are allowed with free phone calls, those numbers would probably be utilized by every offender. We do not have the phones and infrastructure to allow every single offender in the agency to get three 15 minute phone calls a day. Um, it there just isn't possible with the uh, amount of phones and the PBX and the uh, cross lines. Uh, but again, I mean, it could happen if uh, appropriations were given and they can expand the uh, services. The other thing is uh, the wireless devices that I'm hoping we can get through the legislation and through the uh, Board of Prisons this year will allow, if we get everything on it that I'm looking for, we will be allowed to have every offender with one free phone call a day for 15 minutes, but it'll be by a wireless device. Um, currently, if everyone was, uh, didn't have enough phones and were using the phones, uh, they would be bullied, uh, bullied to be able to uh, take place so that somebody doesn't use a phone so somebody else can. That's what I would be concerned with as well. Because uh, if you're not going to get on a phone and it's free, you're going to bully someone else to get their phone time. Um, but that's all I got. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you so much, Director. Uh, anyone in Las Vegas in the neutral position? Not seeing anyone. BPS, let's check the phones for uh, neutral testimony. If you would like to testify in the neutral position for SB 414, please press star 9 to take your place in the queue. We have no callers. All right. With that, we'll close the hearing on Senate Bill 414 and open it up for public comment. Anyone here in Las Vegas, or I'm sorry, in Carson City for public comment? Okay. No takers uh, down in Las Vegas. Anyone for public comment? Okay. Not seeing any BPS. Let's check the phones for public comment, please. If you would like to provide public comment, please press star nine to take your place in the queue. We have no callers. All right. With that, ladies and gentlemen, we are adjourned.